Hello, this is Dean Waldo from Pacific Lutheran University, bringing you a short screencast on osmotic pressure and the derivation that relates osmotic pressure to the concentration of a solute in the solvent. So to start with, let's consider what the experiment is. So if you look at apparatus A, there's a container with a solvent in gray. That solvent would be a pure solvent. Its chemical potential a at pressure P star is would be this value. And we've inserted in the solution an apparatus which at the bottom has what's called a semi-permeable membrane, meaning that only the solvent can pass through this membrane. The blue area would have a solution of A, that same solvent, and a solute B in there. And there's going to be a driving force for the solvent to pass through that membrane and essentially try to make the two concentrations look the same since that membrane cannot pass the solute. Often this is due to the fact that the solute is a very large thing such as a protein or a polymer. As the solvent passes through the membrane the volume is going to increase and then push up against atmospheric pressure P. Atmospheric pressure P is also pushing down on the solvent but as this solution increases in volume, it's going to then exert an additional pressure down, balancing eventually the driving force of the solvent to enter the solution. This pressure, often referred to as pi or the osmotic pressure, we can think of as the height of that column of liquid times its density times gravity. So our goal is going to be to relate that pressure pi to the mole fraction of B in A, or the mole fraction of A in general. The complication of apparatus A is really that as the solvent goes into the solution, the solution changes concentration. So at the end of the experiment at equilibrium, you'd have to sample the solution to calculate what the final concentration is. Another way you can imagine devising this experiment is to have a container where the semi-permeable membrane is um, say vertically between these two different parts of the, the apparatus. So on the left would be the solvent, the right would be the solution. And if you can independently apply pressure to both, you could then apply extra pressure to the solution such that you prevent solvent from flowing into the solution. And in that case, you don't have the complication of the change in the concentration of uh, the solution. So how are we going to relate pi to the mole fraction of A, or the concentration of B in A? What we're going to do is start with the system we presume is going to be at equilibrium. So we're going to say the chemical potential of pure A at pressure P is going to become equal to the chemical potential of A under conditions of mole fraction of A and this additional pressure. So what we can do is state essentially that the chemical potential of A pure at pressure P is going to equal the chemical potential of A pure at some different pressure P plus pi and we're going to use the relationship we know um, on how to convert mole fraction or I should say chemical potential from a pure state to that of a solution state we've seen before, that's chemical potential of A on, at a given concentration, is going to equal mole fraction of A pure plus RT natural log mole fraction of A. So essentially what we can do is apply this to this equation. We're going to end up with the term RT natural log of mole fraction of A. We've essentially then separated the portion due to the change in concentration into this RT natural log A term. Now that gets us part of the way. We next want to separate the additional pressure due to the osmotic pressure from the uh, basically the atmospheric pressure. So what we can do to do that is we can go back to our idea of what the change in chemical potential is. So if we think of what is a change in chemical potential at constant temperature without changing composition, that's going to be molar volume times the change in pressure. 
So then what we want to do is integrate from our chemical potential pure to chemical here, chemical potential at pressure P to chemical potential pure at pressure P plus pi. So let's integrate chemical potential P of A pure to chemical potential A pure but P plus pi. Now to do this we want to integrate the right hand side as well but we're going to integrate that over its uh, variable. So we're going to go from P to p plus pi. And if we write that in the next line, if we do that integral, we're going to end up with mu of a star at p plus pi minus mu of a star p is going to equal um, something on the right. Now let's think about what that could be on the right. Right now, the equation is written with molar volume, assuming it could be a function of pressure. We're going to make our first approximation and assume that that's not the case, that molar volume is not a function of pressure, and so that can go through the integral. And we're going to end up with this term. So if we integrate that, it's a fairly simple integral, and we're going to end up with molar volume equaling pi our molar volume times pi. The p plus pi minus p, the, pi, the p's will cancel. So this will just give us molar volume times pi. And if we then move this term over to the other side, we're going to end up with chemical potential of A pure at pressure p plus pi. That can be represented as two terms now, the chemical potential of A pure at pressure P plus a Vm pi term. So now we can insert this in for the equation above. And let's rewrite that as mu A pure at P equaling mu A pure at P plus molar volume times pi plus RT natural log of mole fraction A. And now we see conveniently that these two terms will cancel. And what we're left with then is going to be 0 equals molar volume times osmotic pressure plus R T natural log of mole fraction A. And what we're going to do is use a relationship, or an approximation, shall I say, of the natural log. You may be familiar with the natural log of 1 plus x being approximately equal to x when x is small. And so we know also that the mole fraction of A can be rewritten as 1 minus mole fraction of B. So we could rewrite this equation as molar volume times pi plus RT times the natural log of 1 minus mole fraction of B. And then we can apply that approximation and what we'll end up with then is 0 equals molar volume times pi plus RT, and then we'll end up with a minus mole fraction B. So with a little rearrangement now, we can rewrite this as pi molar volume equaling mole fraction of B times RT. Now, in some ways, we essentially are finished, but we can sort of change a few things to put it in terms of concentrations or other units that were probably easy that are easier to work with. So let's first realize that mole fraction of B can be written as the moles of B divided by the moles of A plus moles of B. And if we are working with dilute solutions, we'll say dilute solutions, then it turns out 
the concentration, or shall I say the moles of B, are going to be small compared to the moles of A. So we'll say NB is much, much less than NA, meaning that we can rewrite this mole fraction as a mole ratio. So moles of B over moles of A. And again, that is an approximation. So we would say that that term essentially goes to zero. Second, the molar volume of the solution, we essentially can think of as the volume divided by the moles of A, because the moles of A are going to be the dominant species. And if we apply this to the equation on the left, we'll see that we end up with pi V over moles of A equaling moles of B divided by moles of A RT. And conveniently, we can cancel the moles of the A out. And if we divide both sides by volume, we can get the osmotic pressure by itself. Pi will equal moles of B divided by volume times RT. And additionally, the moles of B divided by the volume is essentially a molarity. And so we could write pi equaling bracket B bracket, essentially using the definition or the style of writing for the molarity of B times RT. This equation is essentially the end of the basic derivation such that we've now arrived at what's called the Van't Hoff equation. But what I would like to do is go back a moment and look at the equation up here. Note that this is essentially pi v equals n b r t, and in many ways this looks a lot like what we've seen in terms of ideal gas law. So p v equals n r t. Note the similarity. And one concept that came out of that ideal gas law treatment was treating real gases versus ideal gases. So at this point, we've treated the osmotic pressure as an ideal system, meaning we've used mole fraction back up in our derivation. We didn't use um, what's called activity, where you would actually assume that this is a real solution in the sense that it may not follow the ideas of just the mole fraction giving us the change from pure chemical potential to A. So one way to treat that is to divide the osmotic equation, osmotic pressure equation by the concentration RT. So imagine then we go here and say, well, what if we plot or divide that out so you have BT over RT? Ostensibly, that should equal 1 in an ideal system. But in many ways, solute-solvent interactions have the same ideas of repulsive and attractive interactions as you do in gases. And so we can use the idea of a virial expansion, say 1 plus some sort of second virial coefficient times the concentration of B plus, say, a second virial coefficient times the concentration of B squared, and so on. Practically speaking, most experiments would stop with the second virial coefficient. And you will often find people describing the second virial coefficient for osmotic pressure as the osmotic um, virial coefficient, or the osmotic pressure virial coefficient. A number of different ways to refer to that. One other thing to note is that often you don't know the molar, molar concentration. What you'll know is a mass concentration. You'll know you'll have a mass concentration, say, as C, meaning, say, it might be grams per mil or something like that. And you won't plot pi divided by the molar concentration divided by RT. You would plot pi of C RT. And it's good to note that you can relate the 
molar concentration of B to this concentration that's a mass concentration by dividing by the molecular weight of B. So then our units would be grams per mole, or I should say grams per mil, or grams per volume in the numerator, and dividing it by um, grams per mole, so grams will cancel and you'd be left with units of molarity. So if you were to plot pi over CRT versus concentration, starting at zero concentration, essentially what you would do is you'd have data points as concentration increases and you would extrapolate that back to zero concentration. The intercept would then give you one over molecular weight of your solute and the slope will give you your second virial coefficient or that osmotic virial coefficient. Now just like in gases, um, this second virial coefficient can be a function of other things. So in this case, one, the B may depend on the solvent. So for example, some solvents may be what are called good solvents and B is greater than zero. If the second virial coefficient goes to zero for some solvent, that might be referred to as a theta solvent or two, if you change the temperature, so B would then be defined to be a function of temperature. And so B may be positive, zero, or negative. So just like in gases, when the second virial coefficient goes to zero and you get a boil temperature here, if B at some temperature equals zero, then that temperature is defined as a theta temperature. So to end with, Osmotic pressure can relate to the concentration of the solute and the solvent. And out of it, we get two very important things. We can determine molecular weight and the attractive repulsive interactions between the solute and the solvent. Thank you.